Hey, how you doing? Daniel Ruiz Tyson is available for Monday, the 7th of September 2020. With me, Daniel Ruiz Tyson, episode 266. Hope you're all well, keeping on doing what you need to be doing to keep yourself going. I was thinking a couple of things since last night, going into this morning. I was looking at the numbers on this show. I'm 34 episodes away from episode 300 of Available. I'm thinking that we might just make that by Christmas. It will be tight, but it's looking doable. It's always good to hit a milestone episode on some momentous time of the year, and it doesn't get bigger than Christmas, I suppose. And then this morning, I was thinking after a couple of pieces that I've read in the last uh, couple of days on the virus, including a Jeremy Farrar comment, his free article in The Observer yesterday, and uh, fair play to him because he didn't try to dress up the situation. He was again saying we will have a vaccine for this first vaccine. We'll have a few shortcomings that will be addressed with the next uh, generation vaccine. And I suppose that's a, a realistic assessment of where we are. I'm not sure that I would be tremendously excited about that first vaccine. It's a bit like when I started out in podcasting in 2010, recording on a BlackBerry. It wouldn't allow you to record more than 15 minutes of audio. So each 35, 40 minute episode of Please Don't Hug Me was edited from about seven or eight different bits of audio. And it was just so laborious, worse than now. And more than a decade later, I've just moved on from recording on a battered Zoom H1 mic to just recording using the laptop mic for only the fourth time in something like 500 plus shows. So that's the way I think the vaccine is likely to progress, hopefully 100 times better than that, but along similar lines. I just read in that, It did really get me thinking, would I be up for that first vaccine? I don't know if I would, I think. So rather than thinking something's going to come along in the next year that's going to be a big help, for me, I'm thinking it's going to be a couple of years before there is something available that is going to be really effective. And of course, during that time, you've got to see what the reaction, if any, is to that first vaccine. Every vaccine that there is, of course, is going to have side effects. What are the side effects going to be to this first vaccine that is being put together at such speed? I was also thinking fixating even, I think. Yeah, fixating. I'd go with fixating, definitely fixating. And maybe this is something that you do too. I was contemplating how close I might have been to catching the virus if I haven't already had it. How close have I been to it? Have I returned from a run or the supermarkets via buses lately? Have I come into the flat with the virus on my person and only saved myself through the extensive hand washing, using tissues on the taps when I wash my hands for the first time directly after coming in? I'm washing them after getting out of my outdoor only clothes and then only after washing them a second time. Do I then put on my indoor only clothes? Then I'm using antibacterial wipes to clean all my shopping items. I'm using the wipes on the kitchen worktops too. The whole thing, the whole process can take something like 30 minutes. And I was thinking that if I wasn't doing all of this, would I have got the virus? Have I brought that virus into the flat at any point in the last six months? Is it that half an hour of obsessive cleaning that saved me. Will all of this effort eventually amount to nothing because in early October, I'm looking at the prospect of workmen I've never met putting in new windows and wrecking my toilet. That is making me anxious. That is like having an x-ray and doctors have spotted some shadow on the radiographic image and that shadow is workmen. I think right now there is my life pre-workmen and post-workmen and there is an inconsistency there with my workmen pronunciation. As October nears, I know that I'm going to find that tough. We're only looking at a week, a week long situation. But when I'm thinking of the upheaval, I'm thinking of the amount of cleaning. I'm thinking of the dust sheets that I will need to buy. I don't have enough dust sheets. I'm thinking of all the furniture that's going to have to be moved. I'm thinking about how I'll be able to have all the coffee that I have every day so I can continue grinding through all the stuff that I've got to do on this machine. How will I do that? Because they're going to hear the electric kettle being popped on wherever I am. They might hear it in the bedroom. If one day I have to work from the bedroom because they're working in all the other rooms, they're going to think he's got a kettle in his bedroom. 
and the amount of coffee I have, I'm going to be getting through that water pretty quickly. Also, hospitality wise, do I offer them coffee? Do I offer them biscuits? I'm thinking if I'm trying to have them not use the bathroom, if I'm at loggerheads with the contractors and trying to get them to confirm that they will be bringing a port of loo, you don't really want to be offering them refreshments because that's just going to, um, that's going to accelerate their need to empty their bladder. And even if there's a port of loo outside, highly unlikely, are they going to be going in and out? especially the day on which they're going to be putting in the bathroom window. They're going to think, well, I've got this toilet here. Do I have to go out to the port -a -loo? I think I'm going to have to make myself pat lunches that week. And I'm not a sandwich guy, but I think I'm going to have to spend the week just having packed lunches. I could be looking at a week without running, as by the time these guys leave in the evening, it might be too dark to venture into the park by then. It is just a horrible prospect, this workmen business. And I'm glad, actually, there was some work going on outside in the last 45 minutes before I started recording. It's, uh, oh, no, not oh. Be consistent, Dave. It is 10.47 hours on Monday morning. And in the last 45 minutes, someone was drilling out there. I've given up trying to work out what's going on on this road. It's uh, it's stopped for now. I'm hoping I can get through uh, the rest of the show without that because otherwise that could make the editing very difficult. Yesterday was a relatively decent Sunday, though I had to break the back of some order that had come in. Otherwise, the next couple of weeks become incredibly long. So I had to do that yesterday. While it was a decent Sunday, while it was well structured and I had a workout, Sloth Saturday this week wasn't so gluttonous. But Sundays I'm always back on the exercising. There was a, a one hour cat nap yesterday. I haven't slept properly since Friday. So I was up early on both Saturday and Sunday as if I was still buying the neighbor's paper. I think that's just the hangover from that intense two year period. There is no update as yet on the neighbor. One of the uh, downstairs neighbors, I think, have chatted to her. I think I said that on the Patreon show last Thursday. There is still no news of when she might be coming back. I think that her family have been coming in regularly because the mail that I put out there has, uh, has disappeared. I think they were here on Saturday. They might have been here yesterday as well. So I don't know what's going on. I can see that they're adding things to her flat, a few fixtures and fittings that might give her uh, a bit more time in that flat. I saw the Extinction Rebellion had um, blocked many of or, or all of uh, Murdoch's printing presses at uh, the weekend, I think it was the weekend or Friday, which uh, caused problems with deliveries of his papers. And I'm thinking that if I had still been buying the neighbor's paper right now, how would I have dealt with that if a Daily Mail hadn't been there? I don't think she would have known who Extinction Rebellion are. Well, maybe she would have. Maybe I should credit her with that because, uh, you know, maybe she's not indoors watching ITV or some trash. Maybe she does watch a lot of the news, so she might be aware that there was going to be a problem with her Daily Mail. But if she wasn't aware, how would I have explained that? Because I know that uh, when the lockdown started early on, I would try to, in my messages, convey the concern that I had about going into the small shop across the road to get a paper and that, you know, the situation with my uncle as well was very serious. I was just trying to get her to understand how much I had on my plate. And she never responded to those texts. She never acknowledged them. So for me, I have a feeling that if I had gone into a whole SMS message about how there was no daily mail this weekend, I don't know if there was or wasn't. I'm assuming at some point these papers got out to the shops. How would I have explained the whole Extinction Rebellion thing to her? I think it's one of those texts that she wouldn't have responded to. I just, uh, I think with her, it tends to be, or it tended to be just thanking me, acknowledging that I'd got her the stuff. There was the occasional SMS back and forth, small talk about the weather and, you know, how it was looking like a nice day or how uh, they were predicting rain for the whole day, you know, that kind of weather, small talk. But whenever it was something that bordered on the serious, never got anything back from her. By 1,700 hours yesterday, I thought, that's enough on the laptop. I've done three hours after lunch. The neck and the shoulders are again stiff. I've got eye strain. I have been in contact with the opticians. I think they're just tired of getting my emails and have just told me to call. And uh, I 
had spent three hours on here yesterday. Didn't do anything on Saturday, which is uh, good. And I thought yesterday, I've just got to get off this thing. I've done enough. And it was 1,700 hours. I got off the laptop. I said my nightly prayers, which I've been saying every night without fail since I was four years old, every single night. And that's got to count for something when it comes to afterlife admission and their review in my life. It's got to count for something. And uh, I said my prayers. It's an OCD, I think, that I have to say them before 1,800 hours. It's just something that's kicked in in the last few years. There is the odd night where I've forgotten to say them, and I'll find myself saying them later in the evening in something of a panic that I'd forgotten. Just a little scatcher these days. I think there's lots of stuff to remember. There are nights when I've forgotten my pills. It's just the way it goes now. Either it's stress or it's just age. I said the prayers. And right after finishing the prayers, I immediately launched an expletive, just hurled it into the room, hitting the F hard. I was so disappointed with myself that I'd gone from praying to swearing in an instant. It was a real Jekyll and Hyde moment. I knew that I was tense. I knew that I was stressed. I knew that I needed to address that. But it did surprise me that as soon as I'd wrapped up the prayers, Topped and tailed it with the sign of the cross and then right away just hurl that expletive into the room. Just spewed it forth. No segue, no reason to launch into that expletive. That was just a, a really poor moment on my part. And uh, I knew I needed to try and shake off however I was feeling. I lay down on the floor, not for the prayers. The prayers were done. I was just lying on the floor. It's an exercise I've been doing for some years. As I was lying on the floor, I could feel my shoulders, my neck clicking. You know, I've got audio wise, it's a really loud body now. It's just stiff everywhere. So it's an exercise that I've been doing for some years. You lie on your back, you've got your knees up. It's three stages in all. So you lie on your back, your knees are up, your feet are planted on the floor, but your knees are up. And then the interim stage, you bring the knees first to your chest. You hold that position there for about 30 seconds, a minute if you want to do it for longer. Then you bring your head up to your knees and it's supposed to relieve tension. And it does, I think, you know, you're stretching your back at the same time. I'm trying to empty my mind of all the, uh, all the clutter as I'm doing this and I repeated that a few times and then I just returned to lying on the floor this time nothing with the knees I was just trying to lie on the floor and again not think about anything and just trying to calm myself down you know I've been feeling chest pain since Saturday and I'm doing okay on the coffee I think I'm still drinking as much coffee I've been better in terms of not drinking coffee late into the night I did have a, a, a caffeine coffee uh, late last night, so I could stay up for a uh, Howard Hughes. I think I lasted until midnight. I've just been that tired this weekend. But I've been doing better with the coffee. I'm drinking a lot more decaf. So while I've still got the same amount of coffee in my body, there's less caffeine. So, uh, I mean, you've got to take the pluses where you get them. But I was lying down on my back and feeling these chest pains subsiding. And I'd noted them on Saturday as well. And I was just thinking, you've got to be very careful here because you're not a young man anymore. Daniel Ruiz Tyson is available, episode 266. And this is that part of the show where if this was a successful podcast, I would be trying to vlog you a mattress. I'd have a show producer in the background. We'd pretend that they bought one of these expensive mattresses and it's transformed their lives. But this is a show that remains very much on life support. It's been in a vegetative, uh, vegetative state since its launch eight years ago. People come in and sit at the bedside playing recorded messages from people whose work I've loved and admired over the years. There's a message maybe from uh, David Caruso reprising his much missed Detective John Kelly character. There's a message maybe on there from John Barnes. The messages by now would be about six or seven years old. The number of visitors to my podcast in bedside would have inevitably over the years tailed off dramatically 
since the early days when there would have been more regular visitors. So because of that situation, I always have to give you the following ways to support the show. Please do rate, review and subscribe to the show on Apple Podcasts or iTunes, however you know it. This will take just 30 seconds of your time. If you do enjoy the show, please give it a rating and review. It just increases show visibility for any indie podcast. Right now, if you have a look in the Apple Podcast Store, if you go into the Featured Shows page, every show on there is a big name. It's like live from the Apollo, this obsession with big names, with celebrities in the audience. It's so far removed from what it was, which is why reviews for tiny shows like this are so important. And there have been no reviews this year at all. So uh, that is frustrating. You can also support the show via the PayPal and Coffee.com links on my website at DanielRuizTizen.com. Anyone who isn't a patron who does give a one-off donation uh, to the show via either of those uh, links on my website will get uh, that week's Patreon-exclusive episode we transferred to them on the day. Uh, Most importantly, though, the easiest way to support this work, the best way to support it, is via the Patreon page. It's just £6 a month. You get nearly two hours of content at the moment every week. There is also a second tier. There's an introductory tier for those of you unsure about committing to supporting the podcast. Everyone in the UK, the EU and the US, you can now pledge in your local currency of euros, British pounds or US dollars. And that prevents you paying extra conversion fees from your bank or card when pledging in currency that's not your own. Patrons say they're working on additional currencies. I'm covering the conversion cost at the moment. And if it helps this show grow, that is not a problem. Patreon.com forward slash DRT available. Sign up there for a different kind of podcast. Join those 16 patrons keeping the show alive. I've still not done anything in terms of uh, seeing whether I can appeal the Amazon uh, issue, the Amazon affiliates issue. I recorded a couple of demo ads last week uh, for an advertising campaign. I've not heard back. Indeed, the actual podcasting agencies say they have no record of my proposal of of the demos being sent out. So I actually screenshotted the confirmation that I had indeed done those demos. It was a long shot to do, but I had a bit of fun doing it. I think I might have touched on this on the Patreon show and I need to do more of these. But the problem is that it's it's a US agency and the ads tend to be US centric. I wish there was a UK equivalent. I am doing online searches to see if I can find um, a UK equivalent of Podcorn. Not had any joy so far, but uh, that search will continue. Saturday's catnap dream. Let's push on with the show. Saturday's catnap dream. Sloth Saturday, I should say. It was just a light catnap. And uh, I dreamt I was in the cafe and I was actually sat at my toilet table, despite the government advice not to sit indoors, especially by a toilet table. That is not a, a official advice, but I would imagine that if I ran the usual spot that I occupy at the cafe uh, by some uh, coronavirus advisor, they'd say, no, that's not a great idea. Get out there, sit in the alfresco area. It doesn't matter if they're all smoking. It doesn't matter. Don't be indoors. And in this dream, the late daughter's owner was questioning where I was. There were loads of RIP pictures up behind the counter of regulars who hadn't survived the pandemic. That is a tradition, not the pandemic. Uh, The tradition is when a regular passes away, a cafe regular passes away, there is usually a a badly printed copy of their face with details of their... um, Uh, their demise and the service and where you can send flowers or donations to. And in this catnap dream, I saw my picture up behind the counter, had my details below my uh, picture, David Cruz Tyson. Uh, She said, we thought you were dead. She pulled the poster down, chastised me for not coming and supporting the business. I was there. I was just taking the admonition on the chin. I was preoccupied with going on a run from the cafe all the way to Victoria and back to South Lambeth. This is still the dream. I wanted to see whether I was capable of running outside of a park. And so I wanted to change into shorts, which I'd bought with me into the cafe. I stepped into the curious cafe toilet cubicle with the bowl and the urinal. And as I changed into my uh, shorts, 
the blue external shorts. So I didn't have the interior green shorts reversed, so I could have that sealable pocket at the front underneath the external shorts. As I changed into the blue external shorts, I was trying desperately not to have my shins rub on the toilet bowl for fear of picking up the virus. Though if you got the virus on your shins, what are the chances of that actually blowing up into an infection? I mean, how many times a day do you touch your shins? And from there, to confuse matters, as I was leaving in shorts and the cafe regulars were seeing me in shorts for the first time, future me, he'd survived the first wave and I was pleased to see that he had. But as I emerged from the loos in shorts, I saw him rolling his eyes and as I exited, I heard some of the regulars talking about a serial killer on the loose, the serial killer of Angeltown, Brixton. Let me tell you, I was glad to wake up and start on the housework. On the reading front, I'm about to start Catalina by W. Somerset Maugham, one of my favourite writers. Uh, possibly top five, I think. I thought I'd read all his books, but this is his last published novel. I borrowed it before the first wave. I've still not read it so I've had it for six months so it's back to the latex gloves for library book handling for me. I finished James Lovegrove's Manifestations of Sherlock Holmes last night, a pastiche Holmes collection of short stories which was really really impressive, really enjoyed it. Uh, so the blurb for Catalina from Goodreads, crippled 16 year old Catalina is the one person unable to join in the festivities of the Feast of the Assumption but then she has a vision of the Virgin and is miraculously cured in the dark days of the Spanish Inquisition. Such a claim to blessedness has serious consequences, especially when Catalina seems more inclined to obey her heart than the demands of the church. The last of Morm's novels, Catalina, is a romantic celebration of Spain and a delightfully mischievous satire on absolutism. So I'm wondering whether this is set four or five hundred years ago. That's not really a period of history that I enjoy. I wasn't aware of that. Pushing on with the rest of the show, uh, let's uh, get this week's Nectar Points update. Actually, just before I start on my shopping trips, uh, Lidl last uh, week, just before Lidl actually, I went to my aunt's, I had a coffee with her and my uncle. Neither of them looked great. So uh, always sad when I see them like that. My uncle suggested he and my aunt perhaps fly to Switzerland. We could go to that clinic where they just put you to sleep, he said. My aunt, not looking at my uncle, she rarely looks at him these days when addressing him, she shot back. We don't need to waste that money going all the way to Switzerland. We're on the 11th floor here. We just need to throw ourselves off the balcony. From that grim gallows stroke COVID era 19 humour, I took myself off to Little Stockwell where I saw, without a doubt, the visual of the week. A very, very unusually tall man, a strange-looking man, bit of a local character, an eccentric, one of those guys who's always hanging around in the library, and you get the impression that they're there because even now in 2020, they still don't have uh, Wi-Fi in their flat or home. I've spoken to him before. Well, he actually spoke to me at a bus stop on Kennington Lane last year outside the old big Tesco's out there, which is currently being refurbished. It's going to reopen at some point with the more luxury flats surrounding it. Uh, the model for that, the template for that is the Nine Elms Monster. So Tesco's has decided to go down that route now, which is a shame because the Tesco store on Kennington Lane, it was the perfect size for a supermarket you did not have to walk 20 minutes just to find one item so this guy he'd spoken to me before i've been aware of him for years you know you see these guys on a regular basis and you wonder if they're aware of you too but this guy always stood out initially i thought he had marfan syndrome he's unusually tall thin long limbs but i think it's actually gigantism because he's got the big head that you get with the latter and you don't get the big head with marfan syndrome he carries plastic carrier bags, and in those carrier bags, he'll always have books and belongings. I think unless you've got food or supermarket items in your plastic carrier bags, it's never a, a good sign. You know, if someone doesn't have Wi-Fi, I think, given it's not that expensive now, and if they don't have a, a, a just a proper bag, it might be a battered bag, but a, a proper bag is not a difficult thing to get. 
they're walking around with carrier bags. For me, that's a, that's a sign that uh, something's not quite right there. Anyway, um, a couple of tills away from me at the little self-checkout, I finished my packing and I was leaving. And I passed this guy, this unusually tall guy with a massive head. And he looked like he had a bandana on at the back. I thought that looks uh, a bit odd. But I just assumed that he was using a, a bandana, I suppose, as a face covering. And as I was leaving, I glanced over to get a better look to see this guy from the front. And it was this guy, the uh, giant. And he'd wrapped a bandage, a proper bandage, around his face. That was his face covering. I've never seen that. He looked like the mummy. And it made my day. It made me chuckle again, you know. I know some shops actually, to be fair, their disposable masks are way too pricey for something that, you know, I don't think will protect you much. I wear them, but I'm under no illusions that they're going to save me. But I don't know. I mean, it's going to be maybe five pounds to buy some of these masks. This guy's gone for the bandage. It was just an incredible look. I've never seen that before. I don't expect to see it again. I expect to see him again now that I know to look out for the mummy. It was just... Uh, I mean, he's on his own with that. Maybe he's got the right idea. Maybe he's a pioneer and the rest of us are wrong. Before moving on to this uh, week's Nectar Points update, eventually, he said, uh, there was an odd bus journey, which I need to report Thursday. Was it Thursday? No, I think it was Friday, 13.30 hours, 5th of September. Female passenger, upper deck, southbound bus, coordinated with a yellow raincoat and yellow trainers. I like yellow. I think yellow is a beautiful color. I never wear it, though, because of an experience I had when I was six. We were playing outdoors on Mayflower Road, all the kids, as we usually did in the summer. And I had this yellow T-shirt, Mickey Mouse T-shirt, and the eyes were moving eyes. And I remember it must have been really warm because that evening my yellow T-shirt got covered in little flies. And I was really struggling with that, obviously, because I've got that wing phobia as well, that ornithophobia, anything with wings. And I got indoors. I remember my mum saying to me, it's because it's yellow. I never wore yellow again. That was it for me and yellow. And yet it is a beautiful color. It really is a beautiful color. It stands out, but yet not in a very show-offy way. It's not like a, you know, a bright red, uh, you know, a uh, purple, or whatever. It's not one of those show-off colors. Yellow is just yellow. It's it's out on its own, you know. This woman, let's call her Miss Yellow. She kept pressing the bell between every stop. She was still on the bus when I got off, which I thought was really odd. No plastic carrier bags on her, so I don't know what was going on there with her. Actually, just before I boarded that bus, just after seeing uh, The Mummy, horrendous visual of the week. So I'd had the funniest visual of the week, but the horrendous visual of the week, I saw a male pensioner, long white hair, ponytail, getting off a southbound 88 bus. He was wearing, I'm not sure what they were, actually. They looked more like flip-flops than sandals. They had a loop that went around the big toe, and I just thought that was disgraceful. He'd taken off the mask as soon as he got off. I think he was trying a little too hard to be cool. He got the ponytail, the flip-flop, stroke sandals. It's like, look at me, I don't need a mask. The dated ponytail, you know, that stood out, but the footwear was just obscene. And you're in Lambeth, the dog muck capital of this city, and you're wearing flip-flop, stroke sandals that expose your feet to the muck. And you're relying on these big, hideous toe loops to keep the footwear secure. I wasn't buying that at all. One of the things that we see a lot now with kids, this will make me sound like an old man, but I just think in any era, this is just strange. Uh, kids wearing sliders with socks. And, you know, the sliders, that's come over from the States, as most things tend to do. They look silly, okay? Their purpose was largely aquatic. It was a holiday shoe. You know, it was a shoe for the poolside. They're not great to wear. And to wear them with socks, particularly in a country that is still overall, it's still a cold country. This is a cold, wet country. It's not a practical shoe. And also you see a lot of these kids riding these, you know, these electric scooters now, which you don't hear coming up behind you as they're doing about 200 miles an hour. You've got them wearing sliders on those. You've got them using the Santander bikes with sliders. And I don't understand it because those shoes come off so easily. In fact, I'd actually say, and I base this on my memories of being a kid in Spain on Spanish holidays, 
I think flip-flops are more secure than sliders. And also, if I was a kid these days, and assuming that I was still the kind of kid who can't ride a bike and there's no point in me even trying to get on a scooter, given that one thing that we have now, which maybe wasn't so prevalent 30 years ago, the postcode wars, you know, all the issues that we see uh, with kids now that maybe weren't around 30 years ago, I'd be mindful of my own safety. And I don't think the slider is a practical shoe. I really don't. I think you want a secure shoe. You want a proper shoe. You want trainers. You want something where if you need to run, you can run. What can you do with those sliders? You can't go anywhere. I think they just, obviously, they're a visual thing. Visually, I think they just look stupid anyway. But it's not a very practical piece of footwear. On the masks, meantime, it's incredible that many of those who are wearing masks on buses don't actually have their masks ready before boarding. And the bus arrives, they hold the bus up while they try to stick their masks on. How difficult is it to have the mask on when you're waiting for a bus, or at least have it looped and secured under your chin like I do? So all you have to do is pull it up when the bus finally arrives. I did note that there were more people on buses last Friday, particularly in the mid-afternoon, and that is a worry. So it looks like that 30 passenger limit is starting to be waved away. It's looking like they might have thought now maybe 50 because that was the most packed bus I've been on in the last uh, six months. I haven't been on many, but in the last six months, that's the most packed bus I've been on. And I was lucky to find my own seat. All right, uh, enough waffling. Let's get to the points. Uh, let me just switch the light on here. What's the time? It's uh, 11, 18 hours. Okay, there are some nectar points that I don't know how they... Well, I know how they got on here. They got on here through the Star Wars vintage action figures that I've started to buy ahead of Silver Age Season 5. More on that on Thursday's episode. So it could be that I've got more points than I had last week that weren't on last week's Nectar Points update. But this is uh, Friday's shop, Sainsbury's uh, store, opening balance of 153 points, uh, bought some skim milk. I was aiming to go for two lots of uh, six pinters, one from Lidl and one from Sainsbury's, but the expiry dates on the ones in Sainsbury's weren't great, so I settled for four pints from them. Had to buy some uh, A4 paper for the printer that was 350 bought some sainsbury's own crackers bought a spicy chicken pizza for the calzone conversion on sloth saturday on saturday actually i went for the four cheese pizza that i had as a backup i think you're only meant to keep things in the freezer maybe for three months and i'd had it there longer for three months i thought i'd better eat this you know i should have probably eaten it a couple of months ago but Let's get this out of the way. I added all the toppings that I normally add. And it wasn't too bad, actually, because normally I find the four cheese too cheesy. And I'd actually added more cheese on there on Saturday uh, evening. Uh, I'm glad to have got it out of the way. And, you know, it was pleasant enough. Uh, Bought some wafer thin honey ham. Wafer? When have I been saying wafer? Wafer thin honey ham. Couldn't find ham in little the 75p ham wasn't there the one pound ham wasn't in sainsbury so i had to pay an extra 15p for this wafer thin honey ham uh, i had to buy some fabric conditioner some bin liners uh, a recycled a5 notebook for 45p i do like a, a bit of stationery and that was a bargain what else tin of sainsbury's beans newgate beans still not around in uh, little i don't expect to see them for a while bought a loose bacon potato for 39p some yogurt for a pound 50 four single oranges at uh, 30p each that's one pound 20 so i spent 15 pounds 49 previous points balance going into the store on friday it was 153 i earned 15 points i've got a new points balance of uh, 168 worth 84p so i've still not even reached a pound but you know rome wasn't built in a day etc etc maybe come show 300 around christmas time maybe i can tie the 500 nectar points magic mark in with uh, episode 300 that would be a really special moment in the history of this show and that is it that is the end of this week's regular podcast patron listeners you'll get your weekly bonus edition episode 267 that will be out on thursday and that will include the stunning 
conclusion to Star Wars Football Silver Age Season 4. If you want to join those patrons, the most direct way to support this work is at patreon.com forward slash DRT available. Thank you all for listening. If you're not joining us on Thursday, I'm back next Monday with episode 268. Get those shoulders back. Keep on walking towards the sun. Keep washing those hands. I'm Daniel Ruiz Tyson, and this start of the week, I have been available. <laughs> <laughs>